All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming in. We're gonna wait about two or three more minutes before we start, but thank you all for being with us this evening. Happy reunion um, to everyone here. And I uh, can't wait for the program this evening. I think that we're all gonna have a wonderful time. So thank you all for being here. If folks just wanna put in the chat where you're zooming in from, um, that would be great. Classier location, just to get a feel for the room. Welcome everyone. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. We wanna be respectful of everybody's time. So thank you all again for joining us this evening for the Scholar Tea. Uh, my name is Jalen Baker. And I am a proud alumni of Bates College. And this is the first time I feel like I've announced that to the, to the public before. I graduated in 2016, um, sociology major. And so this is technically my five year reunion. So happy to be back at Bates, even in a virtual space and happy to be a part of this reunion weekend. So I'm gonna give a layout of the program uh, for us this evening and sort of give us sort of like a roadmap of, what, of, what we're, of where we'll be going. And uh, there will be an opportunity for you all, the audience to participate in this evening programs and um, during the during a Q and A portion of the program later on. But I'm just gonna introduce the program and let you all know what the Scholar T actually represents and what it is. So the Scholar T draws from a number of traditions. First, it is about the drink, the tea at the end of the day that ought to provide some relaxation and an occasion for talking. So please, please feel free right now, right now to get some, to get you some tea and some other refreshments, right? Because we're gonna be drinking some tea this evening. And second, when we drink tea, we do so much more than sip. The tea, quote unquote, is not just about the beverage, but it's also about the act of drinking and talking and particularly black, queer Southern traditions. T, the letter is also a stand in for truths, both capital and lower, ca lower case, and a casual way of addressing difficult topics. And we're gonna be getting into some difficult topics this evening, can't wait to get into it. T is also somewhat intimate in that, the, in, in that in the act of sitting around, it is not to be taken lightly, but to be respected and embraced as an honor. So if you don't belong to these, to these tradition, that does not mean that it is not, this is not a space for you. We provide these histories so that you know what kind of space you're entering this evening. So this is one, this is, this is also a space where we also uh, meet with scholars and scholars are welcome to talk about their work, their interests and share them with you in somewhat of an intimate environment. And we expect that we'll have a great time spilling tea together tonight. And we and the scholar that we have, for this evening is none other than Dr. Tari Pickens, professor of English at Bates College and chair of the Africana Studies Department. And uh, Dr. Pickens is also a trusted advisor, counselor, and teacher to me. And the only person that can get me out of the slumber of a, of, of a, of a, of a Wednesday evening to do a program is Dr. Tari Pickens. So I'm so happy to be sitting here with her and, 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 and I cannot wait to see what she has for us. So, so Dr. Pickens is going to be sharing some poems with us on this evening. And the way it's gonna work family is we're gonna have her read some of her poems. Then she and I will engage in dialogue about the poems that she's gonna to read tonight and other topics as well. And after 
her, and after she and I have a have a discussion, we're going to open it up for Q and A. And for the Q and A portion, what we're going to do is, if you want to ask a question out loud and unmute yourself, write your name in the chat, and I'll call on you. That way, we're not all unmuting ourselves at the same time, and uh, we can just we can we can just do that in an orderly fashion. So if you want to unmute yourself, write your name in the chat, and then I'll call on you to ask your question. And if you don't want to uh, ask your question out loud, feel free to add, just to put your question in the chat and I'll read it out loud for everyone else to see. So now without further ado, we're gonna get into the poems tonight. We're gonna get into our scholar who is going to be the, who is gonna be the, who is gonna be the main sort of uh, headline for our tea this, this evening, Tariq Pickens. Please take it away. Right, just gonna dive right in. On this day, you were told to delay my birth with chicken noodle soup. In April that year, they caught the beauty queen killer. Ronald Reagan still had not said HIV slash AIDS. Vanessa Williams had to give up her Miss America crown. I would later become a pageant girl. Those aren't contractions, said the man lying next to you. My Little Pony was on sale and the radio played Do They Know It's Christmas too loudly. Diane Carroll and Joan Collins were on the cover of Jet Magazine in, Jan in January and Bill Cosby in August. I would wear Jet Beauty of the Week tees as a joke. You spent 32 hours in labor and then underwent a cesarean. That summer, the Olympics were held in LA and the Soviets didn't come. They were still angry about 1980. The Apple Macintosh computer went on sale for $2,500. I bought mine for a song. Tina Turner and Prince topped the charts with doves and absent love. It was a Sunday. Big Mama Thornton, Benjamin Mays, Julio Cortazar, and Michelle Foucault all died, and I would inherit thunder from them. Jane Austen would have been 209. In English, I would be the only one to laugh at her jokes. I have an education and, what is, and was introduced properly at 10.37 a.m. in Orange, New Jersey. It was foggy with 97% cloud cover and a high of 43 degrees. Instructions for burial. When, in the pause between breaths, might we rest with the idea that she would not be a memory bearing peals of laughter, except if they echoed at the base of the skull or in the scapulae where memory rides alongside the crunch of broken dishes and the replay of cruelty, but rather the still face will be all we ever keep, the casket set tight as doors and mouths. Being human together is a reality we cannot share. On March 12, 2020, Brianna Taylor awakened after working four overnight shifts at the local ER with its loud flashes and staccato lights, a hustle she said was going to make 2020 the year of Brianna Taylor. And it is a beautiful thing that she and Kenny did what all young couples should get the chance to, that is spend the day just chilling chat at supper time over decent barbecue that is the best you can get outside family and decide between playing high stakes uno or watching a movie what all young couples should get the chance to when they don't choose and do both as they munch freshly baked cookies and ice cream that is the warm dough hugging the, the cold sugar wet before the movie starts watching them curled up in bed and not know what no young couple should get the chance to. That is what interrupts their feeling of just us, what all awaits outside their love. Neighborhood Watch. Mrs. Vandersatten, 48, might actually have a third eye, one for what Stevie Wonder called inner visions. 
and perhaps also a fourth that lets her know when neighborhood kids behave like hooligans. She sits in her front garden encased by a fence. All we see is her bobbing head over each picket. We think she talks to the flowers between resolving our disputes. Mrs. Vandersatten, Kim said Pluto is a planet. Is Pluto a planet? On a good day, she'd answer. On a better day, she'd say, look it up. Mrs. Vandersatten, who's faster, me or Cam? I wasn't watching, she'd lie. Run down the street again. We'd run, she'd say, my husband. Fastest thing on two blades. He hightailed it out of here and never came back. We looked at each other, having never got that detail before. We started to ask other adults questions about her while we waited to get too old to play outside. Like how did a black woman get a Dutch name and where did her husband go anyway and why? My mother told me stay out of grown folks business. Cam's brother said that he cheated and she kicked him out. Cam asked if that was the case, why was his dad still around? Cam's brother said stay out of grown folks business. Last summer, Cam and me got into a fight. I pushed against his bird chest, he mine. Mrs. Vandersatten called, young men, we stopped. Cam asked, well, Mrs. Well, Mrs. Vandersatten, who you think the strongest? And she said, your mama. Variation on a theme. We tired, two syllables, no R. We real tired, because we tried to listen for real, for real. Cool, not for play play. We kept our cool. We keep trying to save ourselves. We left our own selves behind in case things went left. School must reopen, they say. We can't reopen school. We keep other folks and other things in mind. We lurk in our homes and behind masks, lurk late at night in our trembling thoughts. Lately, we think about all the kinds of work we do. Strikes seem a good idea. Back in the day, striking straightened up a company. So here's some straight talk. We telling you, we feel this apocalypse in our bones. We sing to thee of shine and his hustle. We be singing sinfully all them low notes about keeping a peace since we know ain't nobody thinking about us. We thin boned and called essential, a lie so thin, genuine care slips through plus vermouth, lemon, bitters, gin, we toast the inevitable, cause we know we jazz up the coming breathlessness. We listen for March jazz in June. We've been in the house since March, it's June. We know there may not be an end for if we must die, we choose which monster murders us. Some of us will die soon. What Cliff should have told Theo on the pilot of The Cosby Show, September 1984. In the pilot, there was no Princeton going Sandra, the eldest Huxtable kid who would have been in the same cohort as Michelle, but there was no screen time available for black misfits, neither from Chicago nor Brooklyn. And, San and Sandra never brought home friends, only that sad ass Elvin. Theo's desire to be regular people would later be called self-actualization but would never be called by its proper name except in black circles. Vanessa's dour character would never improve in eight seasons, nor would her hair. When Theo is calculating his monthly income, he does not factor in whether he will get paid bi-weekly, how many busted rubbers result in paternity, and stop and frisk. There will also be an enormous cost to realizing you've squandered what wealth fictional black parents built against the odds still. Even in the language of quaaludes, no, won't, never, not, be, no. Claire's career is not on screen. She only exists in the kitchen and the bedroom. So her being an attorney is not apparent. Only Theo's mouth takes her outside home. I brought you in this world and I can take you out was supposed to give Cliff a moment of unobtrusive Reagan era blackness. Claire muttering on the stairs in English and Spanish was supposed to give her a moment of unobtrusive Reagan era blackness. Denise's first date with the merchant Marine gave Lisa Bonet the wanderlust needed for her sudden departure from the port of Brooklyn to a different world. And finally her mooring in the deeply conservative embraces of Joseph C. Phillips and Raven Simone. By the time Theo grew up, they would have gentrified New Jersey. 
and $200 for having a girlfriend would never have been enough. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Pickens for sharing those poems. I cannot wait to get into dialogue with you on this evening about these poems. Again, just as a reminder, after Dr. Pickens and I wrap up our discussion that we're about to get ready to have right now, there will be a time for Q&A for all of you to also pose questions. So let's dig right in. I cannot wait to sort of uh, dive into the, the content that, we, you just discussed, that you just read, Dr. Pickens. So the first question I have is more of a general question about sort of the, the, the collection of these poems. What inspired you to write this particular collection um, in this time? What inspired you to write these poems? Yeah, so some of them are, are old um, and, and some of them were inspired by other poets. So the Neighborhood Watch is a take on Ilya Kaminsky's, um, Ilya Kaminsky's work in uh, Deaf Republic um, and a variation on a theme is a golden shovel uh, with Gwendolyn Brooks's work at the center of it. Um, and so in my head, I've been working on those structures for a really long time. But COVID and um, Black Lives Matter kind of converging in the same year mm -hmm. um, gave me an opportunity to think about those. Um, the on this day, I've always struggled with our, uh, with telling people what day or year I was born in. I'm typically younger than most of my colleagues, um, and typically um, sort of um, in a different position vis-a-vis uh, -vis age with age mates, right? So. Um, you know, I'm not old enough to remember the 1980s as such, but most of the people in my cohort are. And so I struggled with that. So on this day was a way of reckoning with the year in which I was born um, and also reckoning with what the larger cultural context of the 80s is for Black people. Um, I So I was on sabbatical when I wrote most of these um, during the year of uh, 2019, academic year 2019. Sorry, I live on a really busy street if you hear the background noise. Um, it's during the year 2019 to 2020. Um, and having that space um, was a moment to just sit back and kind of explore structures to, to mess up things um, in the writing of the poetry and feel like I could come back to it. So it's, it's all of those head spaces kind of converging in those, in those six pieces. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. And as we get into um, some like more concrete question about this collection that I'm going to ask, I must admit that I feel like I probably would be better equipped to ask you questions about these poems if I would have taken your Black poetry class when I was at Bates. I did not take it <laughs> sophomore year. I was a 19 year old like sophomore that did that thought that poetry was just too like this is too deep. I can't interpret poetry. And can't know, even the brilliant Dr. Pickens cannot teach me how to interpret poetry. It's a regret. I admit, I, I should have definitely taken the class. I would have been way more prepared. But we're just going to do what we're going to do. We're just going to do what we can do and see and see what happens, right? Yeah. So I want to ask you a specific question about your poem, Instructions for a Burial. I really love this poem. And I love that last line in the poem where you say, being human together is a reality that we cannot share. Because to me as a reader, this led me to ask the questions, one, what does it mean to be human? And two, what is it about the human experience that makes it difficult for us to share it together? And these yeah. are really important questions, I think, especially in the context of living through a global pandemic. And, it, and it's, it's interesting that you sort of tease these things out as you were sort of grappling with these issues. So my question to you is, when you wrote that last line in particular, did you have something in mind that you wanted readers to take away from it? And what did you, the poet, what do you take away from that line? Yeah, so this is actually one of the older poems in the in the selection that I oh, read. Interesting. Um, interesting. Yeah, I didn't write this one. This was it's a pre-COVID poem. Wow. Um, hmm. And it's actually about grappling with the death of a, of a person that was an asshole. Right, like when people are like, oh, you can't speak ill of the dead. It's like, what if the person was just terrible, right? Like, how do you grapple with that? Um, and so that's one of the reasons why it's why it's one long question. Um, so syntactically, it's it's one it's one sentence structure. It's one question. 
um, and the parts that are between the dashes are meant to describe how tough it is to remember this person, right? She would not be remembered for. Um, so by the time you get to the last line, you actually, I actually have in mind this uh, particular person that I'm trying to mourn mm -hmm. and how difficult it is to mourn someone uh, when they leave behind such painful memories. Um, but, you know, as I think good poems do, which I'm actually, I think this is the first time I'm calling one of my own poems good. Usually poets are like, oh, it's crap, right? So um, as the fact that it lives in a context of COVID and makes sense there mm -hmm. is also about the fact that being human together is dealing with the mistakes that people make, mm -hmm. dealing with the context in which they live and die, dealing with that space between the dash Right, or what that dash represents. Usually we see the dash on tombstones, right? 1961 dash 2020 or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so I'm thinking about like the, um, the difficulty of the volume of deaths we've been dealing with. Hmm. And so being human together forces us um, to communicate across not just difference and not like social difference. I think a lot of people are focused on that now but communicating um, across significant differences in perspective, which may or may not be about social location difference, right? Um, there are, um, I'm a disabled black woman, there are black disabled women I have difficulty with, mm -hmm. right? So what does it mean to be human together when our difficulty is, um, is one of communication, is one of personality, is one of, um, hmm. what happens when two people are in community, right? How are you in community with people? You, you love them, but you don't like them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How are you? And for anyone who is, has been in a major relationship, mm -hmm. there are some times when you look at your partner and you're like, oh, you're the best thing since sliced bread. I'm so glad that your chromosomes combine to make you who you are. It's just one big love fest. And then other times you're like, I wish this motherfucker would get out of my face. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a there's a truism to what that is when you're trying to be human together. And that goes for partners, that goes for best friends, that colleagues, certainly colleagues. Um, so yeah, you know, that's that's what I think of when I think of that that last right. and, line. And, and, it, and it also goes for pastors, right? I'm I'm, I'm currently <laughs> pastoral ministry, and I cannot tell you how many members I cuss out in the in the in, in the in the privacy of my home. You were not do, to say I can't that. do it in your face, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I definitely, so I definitely, I, I definitely resonate with that for sure. Um, I want to shift to another poem you talk about, which is on March 12, 2020, Breonna Taylor, right? And this, this, this may have been out of the collection of poems of all of them. This may have been my favorite one. Um, and one of the things I love about this poem was your phraseology of just us, right? Yeah. I love that. And as I was thinking about Just Us, I think it might be a reference to Richard Pryor, the comedic genius. Yes. Yes, right. Richard Pryor tells this joke where uh, he, he, he says he's, he goes to the jailhouse looking for justice. And that's exactly what he finds, just us, like just black people, right? Mm -hmm. um, just people that look like him. And I think the brilliance of you using this phrase, especially in the context of Breonna Taylor, is in the way you're able to communicate the idea that in order for Black love, as you talk about in the poem, and Black people to be free, to be just us, we must be free from the threat and intervention of racist violence, right? Mm -hmm. And Black people have to live in a society governed by justice in order to be just us. Right. And you lay out the state of being just us so eloquently in the poem. So you, you just take prior and just go to, you just, you, you just start dancing. You just yeah. you, you dancing, you dancing. <laughs> I love how you use it, right? So my question for you is, what was it about Breonna Taylor and her tragic murder that made you wanna highlight and explore this theme of just us? Yeah, so Jalen's cheating a little bit. He knows that I'm a student of comedy. Um, so it's, it, you know, it's Richard Pryor, it's Paul Mooney, it's Moms Mabley, mm -hmm. it's, Pigmy Markham, Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock's early work, Cat Williams. Um, it's, you know, Monique when she was good. Uh, Adele. <laughs> I'm, like, make me mute myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't want you to spit your tea out. But it's, I mean, that's, 
that's the tea, right? Monique used to be really good. Um, and she's not quite, so <laughs> she's not quite there um, anymore. But, um, you know, it's a lot of those folks who make comments and, and have commentary about um, justice and, and what it means there. But um, I think for me, this poem emerged out of, um, out of the injustice of it all, right? She was sleeping, you know? Um, and as someone who, um, you know, we, we had to, March, March 12th uh, was, I think, uh, a Thursday. March 13th was the Friday, the Friday that Bates faculty and students found out that we were um, going home. Mm. And um, that was also the day that I got a follow-up call from my doctor. So March 1, I got a call from my doctor that was like, if they could have cooked something up in a lab that would kill you, this is it, stay home. And then I got a call on March 13th that was like, I saw your Instagram page and you were out, stay home. Um, my doctor's very involved, um, lovingly so. Um, but you know, I think that um, that day for me held some very particular significance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, as a person who's constantly in and out of the ER um, and reflecting on how, how much we needed ER workers, um, that also hit me. But I was listening to um, a retelling um, of the incident surrounding uh, Breonna Taylor's death on the New York Times podcast, The Daily. Um, and normally podcasts don't bring me to tears. But there was something about me, the, the simplicity of me being in my kitchen, making oatmeal, listening to Michael Barbaro and whomever else talk and him giving all this vivid detail about the day that they spent together. They did go out and eat barbecue. She did make freshly baked cookies. They did play Uno. They did have a movie start watching them before the shooting started, before the, the knocking occurred. Um, so there was something about that series of events that made me want to tell the story of the day before, mm. right? Like mm. what happened when she was living mm. in part because so many stories are about black death. Like we focus on the fact that she got shot while she was sleeping. Mm -hmm. How did she live her life with this man that she loved in the day before her death? And there's something heartbreaking about the fact that it was for two lovers, a beautiful day. Mm. She comes home from work, he's present for her. They spend quality time together. They share a meal, they play some games, they watch a movie and they go to sleep. That's a lovely day. Mm. And if that had to be her last day, what a last day to have, to know she was loved before she was gone. That's what I wanted to celebrate. That's why the, the last word is, is love and not an emphasis on um, the difficulty of the justice, justice moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thanks. Love that so much. And I wanna shift the conversation a little bit here because um, not to pick, because I think that you can actually help us out a little bit, because we're living <laughs> in this moment right now, mm -hmm. where one of the most polarizing topics in the country right now is critical race theory, yeah. which I find absolutely fascinating, quite frankly. Um, and there has been just this intense debate about whether critical race theory should be taught in public schools, about whether it should be engaged with in different spaces. There's even been intense debate about whether critical race theory should be should be sort of used by religious leaders right in spaces that i've been involved in to help congregations and to help uh audiences think through race racism as it relates to their faith um so i'm wondering what what do you make of this debate we're having right now as you write about these issues such as brianna taylor black lives matter disability blackness and all the intersections that come with it what do you make of this just extremely polarizing debate that we're having right now? And do you think that critical race theory is an effective tool for educators to use and leaders to use, any, any leader to use, to engage okay. with issues of race, racism? Um, <laughs> so before I wade into arguments, 
um, either in the classroom or even with family, and my family gets pissed off with me about this, I like to define my terms. Mm -hmm. So what is critical race theory? It is a branch of jurisprudence. It is a branch of law that comes out of Harvard, some Harvard students in the late 80s, early 90s, including um, Devin Carbato, Kimberly Crenshaw, and quite a few others, all right? So critical race theory is an area of law. Can everybody teach law? No. So are they talking about critical race theory? No. Mm. But in fact, they are talking about our um, lenses about race that are critical, right? Um, and I think that um, this is the same debate we were having in the 80s around culture wars. Mm. This is the same debate we were having in the 90s about identity politics. Mm. This is the same debate that we've been having about critical eth ethnic studies. It's an ongoing debate just with a new vocabulary. Mm. Um, and it's an ongoing debate where the people who are in charge now have a little bit more power to enact some of these, um, to enact some procedures and structural changes to allow for the, um, the study of a fuller, more transparent history. Mm. So do I think that it's an effective tool for my teaching? Absolutely. Um, what what uh, looking at race, power, privilege, white supremacy, colonialism, what that allows me to do in a black studies class is talk about black studies as a field, mm -hmm. um, as a field with various opinions, with various histories, knowledges, and cultures. What it allows me to do is um, talk about the insidiousness of white supremacy, how it damages white people. Um, and uh, how it damages relationships between communities of color. So it allows me to take um, Blacks to task for their uh, anti-immigration views in the early part of the 20th century, right? Splashed across the, the pages of Crisis Magazine, W.E.B. Du Bois's NAACP Magazine, right? Jesse Fawcett um, has a, a large degree of anti-immigrant sentiment. Right, because it served black populations who were thinking about the way that white immigrants were coming in and assimilating more quickly. Um, so they were, some of them were anti-immigrant, right? It allows me to have those discussions. It allows my colleagues in other fields to talk about in psychology, for instance, even the rat was white, right? There's a difficulty with the methodology of psychology such that the understanding of anyone considered a quote unquote subject is um, is subject to the um, particular assumptions that come along with being um, looked at by someone who doesn't fully understand your cultural context, mm -hmm. right? It allows my colleagues in religion, right? Um, those who are practitioners as well as those who are academics to think about why something like liberation theology, which is, uh, it's a wide field, I'm sure you can tell us much more about that, but why it has traction, mm -hmm. right? Why is it that this um, makes sense for some people? Why is this the Jesus they wanna hold on to? Mm -hmm. Why is it that um, something like uh, Mark Cohen's book, Under Crescent and Cross, um, how is it that uh, anti-Blackness functions in, uh, um, in the golden age of Islam, right? Um, how is it that that functions uh, alongside uh, Christendom, right? In what uh, we call, what we call the Middle Ages, what is also the Golden Age of Islam, right? How is it that we can tell a fuller history? Um, so yes, I think it's useful. Yes, I think people don't understand what they're talking about. I think it becomes this sort of red flag people are waving. Um, in order to actually get away from the fact that history should be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? Because if our personal histories, this goes back to instructions for burial, if our personal histories are uncomfortable, why wouldn't the histories of our nation states and our cultures also be uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. There should be things that you are embarrassed about in your cultural history, mm -hmm. right? 
I'm embarrassed that Mitch McConnell is part of my cultural history as a disabled person in America. Mm. I'm embarrassed about the um, indigenous heritage that some of my family members claim and how it is that that was, how it is that that happened, right? They were slaves of Seminoles, right? So how, um, how though my last name is Pickens, right? South Carolina, William Pickens was the governor of South Carolina. He wrote the papers of, of secession that for some that some historians believe started the Civil War. That's an embarrassment to me, mm-hmm. but it is a history. I can say it, I can live with it, I can deal with it, right? Um, to run away from that, to ignore it, to obfuscate it, and to um, willfully decide to not teach it is to lie to future generations about the mistakes we've made and Mm -hmm. how it is we can actually move forward from having made those mistakes. Mm -hmm. How much more powerful will we be with an informed public? And how much more powerful will we be, how much more powerfully will we be able to move toward justice, toward coherence, um, toward, um, uh, toward community, if we actually are clear about what's happened in the past. You as a pastor know this, you can't forgive if there's no admission of wrongdoing, Mm -hmm. right? You can't move forward until you go back and get it, right? Very Sankofa. So critical race theory, as people are understanding it very broadly, is an opportunity to do that. Um, It's an opportunity to reckon with the past honestly, right? it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, um, but it, it is necessary. Yeah. And I think so often what critical race theory has become is sort of like it's moved in, a, in, a, in the other direction, right? Rather than becoming an opportunity to reckon with our history, it's become an opportunity now to, to categorize someone as someone as someone that, that we're not, right? So if, right. You, so, if, so if you talk about race, if I preach about race from the pulpit, that means you're a critical race theorist, right? That means that you're liberal. That means that you watch MSNBC. And that means that, that, that and, and that, so, 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 it, so the right has in some ways co-opted this language so that people can now put folks in, in different categories, right? right? Rather than rather than it being sort of getting into what the heart of what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think I think those who want to embrace the theory for, for the things that you're saying are up against. A cultural war, right? I think I think that it is. I think that it has become a cultural war term, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, and how we fight against that, you know, is something that we're grappling with every day. So I want to sort of dig into this just a little bit more. And, and um, I'm, I'm going to ask Dr. Pickens two more questions, and then we're going to open it up for Q and A again. If you want to ask a question, you know, feel free to put your name in the chat. If you want to unmute yourself, and if you if in the, if you want uh, to just post a question in the chat, then we can also we, we can just read it out loud for, like that. So two more questions. So I want Dr. I want to give you the opportunity to share a lot on critical race theory from some sort of from 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 a perspective that you shared. So I saw a few weeks ago you posted a tweet where you where you posed a question about critical race theory. Yes, I follow Dr. Tariq Pickens. You should follow her too. And we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to the how you can follow her at the end of the program. Um, so you asked, could conversations around critical race theory be enhanced by expertise on disability and race? I want to just give you the space to sort of like shed light on this question that you raise? So I tweeted that to Mark Lamont Hill, who is a um, prolific writer, a scholar I respect, and also has a incredible public profile for two reasons. One, I think that very rarely do we ever, um, do we ever talk about blackness and disability except in um, some terms that are that are degrading, right? Um, or just not true, right? Black people can't be disabled. That's, that's not true. Um, you know, or blackness is a disability, also not true. Um, so, you know, I think I think there's a crucial p- perspective missing from those conversations. And so I wanted to challenge him to think about that. Mm -hmm. Um, especially because he tends to be a very thoughtful person, even on Twitter, which I think is hard to do. Um, And I think he listens to critique very well. Um, The other reason why I tweeted is because I was being deliberately provocative for all who follow him um, to ask them to think about where disability sits in their imagination. Um, 
I find that talking about disability makes people uncomfortable. Um, and I think that it makes people uncomfortable because it makes them reckon with their own embodiment and sometimes their fear of what disability represents for them. Um, and because our discussions about disability tend to be often medicalized, sometimes spiritualized as moral failure, um, sometimes understood as burdensome, right? Sort of a social conundrum uh, rather than part of human variability, rather than part of how we understand um, what it means to be in the world. Uh, that as Susan Sontag describes it, there's a kingdom of the well and a kingdom of the sick, mm -hmm. and you can move between those. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I love that book actually. It's called AIDS and its metaphors, um, and um, or illness and its metaphors actually. And um, I, I think, you know, talking about disability makes people uncomfortable because they have to reckon with where they, where they sit, right? Mm -hmm. And how pretty much every metaphor in our language is ableist, mm -hmm. right? Um, I stood up for what I believe in. Did you really know? Did you really stand? Or were you just being very forceful in your tone, right? Um, and if you did stand, what about the people who can't stand up, right? Are they less forceful in their tone, right? Um, a wow. uh, sure-footed perspective, right? That's, I love that one because it, it means that there's something about walking and something about being ambulatory that is, is somehow a little bit more um, uh, trustworthy, right? Um, and a little bit more clear um, about itself. It, le it links the able body with the able mind. Mm. Um, so I, was, I was being deliberately provocative when I asked that question. Um, the truth of the matter is that I think every discussion is enhanced by a discussion of disability and race, because mm -hmm. um, there's no place where we don't appear, um, uh, disabled folks or black folks or po people who occupy both uh, categories. So that's, you know, I'm, I mess around on Twitter a lot to try to, <laughs> try to make people who wouldn't ordinarily listen to me, listen to me. In my head, Mark Lamont Hill has seen the tweet and is working on a new book <laughs> um, I'm citing my work. Um, and he's going to have me on his show, right? Um, so that's <laughs> that's where I'm at. Don't you sip your tea at that comment? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, beautifully said though. Be the, the, the beautifully said though. No, as 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 with everything, as with everything else you've said tonight. Um, last question, and then we'll move into time of Q. And the last question really is just about your writing practice or your writing process, right? And it really is just a question of like, how do you ready yourself? How do you position yourself to write um, such insightful work and these insightful poems that you've, that, you've, that you've written now? And it can be books, poems, but what is your writing practice and process to, to be able to produce such work? So to me, writing is any step between the inkling of an idea to its eventual being in the world. Um, sometimes that's publication, sometimes that's a presentation, sometimes that's a class. Um, and so anything that assists in that is what I, um, is what I consider to be writing. So that's, you know, the research, that's note taking, that's having a meeting with a research assistant, that's a conversation with a news source now that I'm uh, writing for, um, writing for public places. Um, so writing for me is really capacious in terms of my definition of it. And I spend at least 30 minutes writing uh, every day, Monday through Friday. I think taking the weekend off is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. um, I think writing each day, um, because the, the muses uh, are, they're fictitious. Um, and they, <laughs> They, um, they don't, if they were real, they certainly are unreliable. So one of the ways to uh, keep yourself in the, um, in the headspace of writing is to be deliberate about the act of it. Ideas come, right? Um, I, <laughs> I never feel excited about exercising, um, but I know I have to do it. I get on the bike and I'm energized by the time the 30 minutes is up. Now, the writing, there are some days when I sit down to read or to put words um, on the page and I'm like, this is trash. Um, and sometimes it is, but 
you know, after at least 30 minutes, I'm kind of done. Um, or I've got more time slotted to switch to another act in the writing process. Um, and I, uh, and I come back to it. I think the other thing is sort of, you can't be a good writer if you don't read. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, and I'm a, I'm currently a poet, but you can always tell the poets that only read other poets. Mm -hmm. If they don't read anything else, their poetry is going to sound a little niche mm -hmm. um, and not in a good way. So reading widely, reading consistently, mm -hmm. reading things that um, are tangentially of interest. Um, I found myself reading about ornithology the other day. I'm not a bird watcher. I'm not someone who's deeply connected to that community, but it was very interesting. Um, and I was also, as a writer, looking at turns of phrase um, and looking at um, syntax and looking at some of the very specific words that were there, Latin, uh, Latin roots, what had Latin root, what had a Greek root, all of those is sort of, you know, kind of playing with words because um, that's my medium, right? So you can't be a good writer if you're not a good reader. Um, inspiration is not uh, an accident. It's a habit and mm. take weekends off. Yeah, that's yeah. quotable right there. That's, that's a whole bar. That's, whole bar. <laughs> that's, the, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. <laughs> that's great. And I love how you said, because I think uh, Toni Morrison once said, the late, great Toni Morrison, right? Uh, that before she was a writer, she was a reader. She's a reader first. Um, and Toni Morrison, probably the greatest to ever do it, right? Fic fic at least in the fiction realm. Um, yeah. If she says that, you know, that I think I think that's 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 gospel, right? So it is. It is very good news. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, that's all I have, family. Uh, that's all the questions I have, Dr. Pickens. And uh, she answered them all brilliantly and beautifully. I appreciate it. But if you all have any questions, um, now is the time. Feel free to um, to please post them in the chat. Post your name in the chat, and we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to call on you to meet yourself and ask your question out loud. Um, we can take questions about what it is we've talked about here, as well as my position at Bates, uh, what I do here, what um, life has been like, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Deborah Clending, Clendening. I'm sorry if I, sorry if I butchered your last name. My apologies for that. But please unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Clendening works. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, first, you know, this is 50 years since I graduated. And... I just cannot believe how different Bates is from, 50, well, obviously 50 years ago was a long time ago, but um, the word that keeps coming to my mind is sterile, you know, kind of the environment then. And of course the Vietnam War sort of blew a lot of that away, but uh, there's just a richness. I've been listening to several talks and on the MLK day, uh, just the, oh, I don't know, the breadth and richness of what, um, what is coming out of all of folks at Bates. I really appreciate that. Mm. Uh, there's one phrase in one of the poems, uh, for if we must die, we choose which monster murders us. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, that just the idea of choosing my monster just oof, feels yeah. really uncomfortable. So, yeah, yes, it's supposed to be. So If We Must Die is a sonnet composed by Claude McKay. Um, and he's a writer uh, out of the Harlem Renaissance. It's a sonnet that never ever mentions blackness but was understood to be talking about it um, and using the sonnet form, which is a, a form about argumentation to make the argument that um, that there is a defiance there um, when one is uh, fighting against injustice um, and when one is understanding oneself as, as under siege in, um, in a certain kind of way. So that's the reference for if we must die. Uh, we Choose Which Monster Murders Us is uh, about the concern that many people had. Um, yes, that's the poem. Thank you, uh, Bethel. Um, the concern that many people had um, 
when there were marches and protests in May and June of 2020, um, that people were concerned that there would be super spreader events. And um, I saw folks' desire to be in the streets as a deliberate choice. Um, I will, I may or may not die from COVID, but I am choosing that I don't want to die by the hand of extrajudicial violence um, and state sanctioned violence. Um, and so that choice to march, um, and you know, they actually didn't turn out to be super spreader events, which is quite interesting. Um, or not interesting, I should probably use the word I mean, it is quite telling um, that uh, the fights and march, marches for justice were very clearly um, invested in safety of multiple kinds. And so that's where that line comes from. But I think if we were to uh, take away some of the specific context of, of 2020, then what we would be left with is um, that there uh, is a passion and a um, what some might consider to be a recklessness, but a series of choices that people who are um, under siege are making, right? Because that line is, to my mind, when I wrote it about protesters, someone else could see it about teachers or essential workers. So there's um, there's quite a bit in there, I think, for, for folks to read. Poetry is sometimes what you bring to it. Um, and sometimes the poem is, is actually reading you. So there's a, you know, the poem often reads me as the poet. It's, it's a, that's not uh, just unique to the, to the reader. Thank you for that question. Any other questions from the audience? Right. Well, I feel like I've been to church and, I, and, and, and there, there's something within me that wants to say, let the church say amen, but I'm not going to do it. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, not, not going to play that. I'm not going to play the preacher this evening. But uh, I, it, this, this, has, this has been a wonderful time. I have loved every single minute of it. And I am now going to turn it over to Jalisa De Los Santos and she's going to close us out. So Jalisa, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Julissa de los Santos and I work in alumni engagement with my colleague Jasmine Jackson on the line. Um, and we wanted to personally thank you all for coming in particularly Dr. Pickens and Jalen who took time of his day uh, to kind of give us a fabulous kind of co-hosting here. And uh, Dr. Pickens and I were on the side being like, oh my goodness, look how awesome and fabulous. <laughs> any, any conversation that you wanna kind of engage, we would love to have you. Um, this is part of kind of uh, what we are calling mosaic programming. It kind of started in 2015 um, and then there wasn't much happening in the last couple of years, but we have recently kind of reinvigorating it um, and pretty much offering opportunities for alums to connect uh, from various population and groups and, and really finding ways to highlight in particular some of our faculty who are doing really great um, awesome work on campus. And so we thank you all for joining us this evening. A big thank you to Dr. Pickens and Jalen Baker for, this is Jalen's fifth year. And I think this, you know, <laughs> we connected a couple months ago. He's like, I'll do it. I'll do it for you and Dr. Pickens, but <laughs> a great job. he might get a couple more ask uh, as we move forward. Uh, but thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really lovely uh, to have you all here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing space with us today. Uh, thank you, Buff. <laughs>